click the bell icon to turn on notifications. We've made the files the instructor uses in this tutorial available for free. Just click the link below in the video details to get these. So Adam's just put up on the screen our agenda for today. So we're going to start out by just doing a brief discussion about what exactly formulas and functions are. I'm going to show you how calculations work so you can really understand how formulas are constructed in Excel. We're going to go through some of the uh, basic formulas. I'm going to show you how you can use them in different ways and show you lots of tips and tricks as well, just to make yourself a little bit more efficient when you're working with formulas. So we're going to look at things like sum. I'm going to show you auto sum and auto fill with keyboard shortcuts. We're going to talk about operators and the bod mass rule. If you're not sure what I mean by that, then you didn't pay attention in maths class when you're at high school, but we will get to that. We're going to go through things like average, min, max, count, count A. I might even throw in a bit of count if in there for you as well. We're going to talk about something really important, absolute versus relative referencing, a, a, a concept that you have to understand if you're going to work successfully in Excel. I'm going to show you how to use named ranges in formulas, something that is super helpful, particularly if you have a large data set. And then we're going to blast through just some really useful functions that everybody needs to know. So I'm going to show you quite a few different text functions, which are going to help you tidy up your data, extract things from cells, things like that. I'm going to show you how you can create unique lists of values and also how you can join text together using the concat function. We're then going to move on to doing a little bit on logical formulas. Again, super important if statements and nested ifs. And then we're going to end with VLOOKUP, everybody's favorite function. Well, at least it's one of mine. I'm going to show you how VLOOKUP works and we're going to throw in some error checking formulas in there as well. And as I said, as we go through, I'm going to try and uh, include keyboard shortcuts, tips and tricks, which are really going to help you out. So that is what we are covering. Now I'm going to ask Adam to stop sharing his screen and I'm just going to share mine. There we go. If somebody can just tell me if they can see the Excel spreadsheet, preferably Adam, because I can hear him. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can see it there. Someone drop us a comment, let them, let them know you can see it as well. Um, but yeah, it's looking good here. I can see Q1 to Q4 in total and Jan to Excellent. December. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right, guys, let's start right from the beginning. So when we're dealing with formulas in Excel, formulas really are the backbone of Excel and it's mainly what Excel is known for. So it is super important that you have the relevant skills to be able to construct formulas in your toolkit. And what do formulas do? Well, they basically help us perform basic to complex calculations in Excel. So that might be something from the very simple act of adding up a list of numbers all the way through to extremely complex lookups, logical formulas, time and date calculations, and so much more. So it is important to have a good foundational level of skills from which you can build on later down the track. Now, what exactly is a formula? Well, it is a calculation and formulas in Excel use functions. And we can use one function in a formula, or we can combine together multiple functions to perform more complex calculations. And really the skill that will help you move towards becoming an Excel expert is to be able to look at the data, look at the work that you're doing and work out what formula or what combination of formulas you need to use to accomplish the task. And that is really the difference between somebody who might consider themselves being an intermediate Excel user and somebody who is an advanced user. Advanced users can look at data and work out the combination of functions they need in order to accomplish the task. Okay, so that's kind of what we're gonna be working to, towards. I will say it does take practice, practice, practice to get to know. But we need to start out by knowing what our formulas do. Now, there are over 500 different functions in Excel. You will find them on the formulas tab in this functions library section. And all of your formulas are divided down into different categories. Now, I will say that over the course of your Excel career, there is no way that you're going to use all 500 of these. Some of them are very specific to certain injury, uh, to certain injuries, industries, <laughs> such as accounting or engineering. You'll probably find there are about 15 to 20 formulas that you use all the time. 
And I'm going to include lots of those in the session today. So let's start out with something quite basic, and that is the sum function. This is the first function that everybody learns when they're working in Excel. What does sum do? Well, it lets us add a list of numbers together. Now, when you're working in Excel, if you want to create a function, the first thing you need to do is type an equals into the cell. That lets Excel know that you want to type a formula. Now, what I could do here is I could type something like 10 plus 20 and hit enter. That is going to perform a calculation. I haven't used a function. I've just hard coded those numbers in. Now, you can do that. You're going to get the correct result, but I would not recommend hard coding numbers into your formulas. It's much better to use something like cell references. So let's just do that again, but this time I'm going to have my numbers written out in different cells. So if I now wanted to perform this calculation, what I could do is I could say equals, and then I can select the cell reference as opposed to hard coding those numbers in. So I can do I3 plus I4, hit enter, it's going to give me the correct result. But the difference here is if one of these numbers in this cell changes, that formula is going to update because I'm referencing the cell as opposed to hard coding a number in. OK, so really important, don't hard code numbers into formulas unless you absolutely have to. Always try and use a cell reference. Now, with that in mind, where does the sum function come in? Well, the sum function you can use when you have a longer list of numbers. So, for example, in this little table, you can see that I have some Q1 figures here from January to December. And maybe I want to find out what the total is for the entire year for Q1. So what I could do here is type in equals and I can use the sum function. Now, notice as I start to type in this function, I get a little menu pop underneath. This is called IntelliSense. And you'll find this whenever you start to type in a formula, Excel is going to search through its massive database of formulas and give you a list of all of the ones that match what you're trying to type. So if you see in this list, you can select it simply by using your arrow keys. I want sum. All I need to do here is press the tab key. It's going to put that first bracket in for me. Formulas are always enclosed inside brackets or parentheses if you're in the US. And we're going to talk more about that in a moment. But for the time being, take a look at this little function. We have sum. Now, notice underneath, I have a little screen tip that says number one, comma, number two. Now, what you see in this screen tip underneath, this is there to help you. It's basically the, the what we call the function arguments. This is the information you need to provide the formula in order for this formula to work. So I want to add up some numbers. And basically, what this is telling me is, I need to tell it what numbers I want to add up. So I want to add up everything above. So I'm going to select all of this cell range just here, C3 to C14. Notice that 2 is represented by um, a colon in Excel. You must always close the bracket, hit enter, and we have our sum calculation. If I click back up in that cell, take a look up in the formula bar, I can see my formula up there. If I need to edit it, I can simply click up here in the formula bar. Or alternatively, I can double click in the cell and edit it within the cell. Escape to come out. So that is one way that we can utilize the sum function to quickly add up a list of numbers. Now, there is another way that we can use the sum function, and that is by using autosum. So if we jump up to the formulas tab at the top in the functions library, we have an auto sum drop down just here. And you can see what I call the big five formulas in Excel. So these are the ones that you're probably going to use most often. Now, one of them, the first one is sum. Look what happens when I click it. It automatically puts in the sum formula and it selects the nearest range of cells. So it's made an intelligent guess as to what it is that I'm trying to add up. And in this case, it's got it right. So all I need to do is hit enter and I have my total. I could do this in an even quicker way. If I want to invoke that auto sum, but I don't want to have to go up to formulas and click on auto sum drop down, there is a keyboard shortcut for this. And that keyboard shortcut is alt semicolon. Sorry, not alt semicolon, alt plus. 
<laughs> and that's going to invoke the auto sum. Okay, Alt plus. It's made the same selection. Hit enter, and we've added up our numbers. The next way we can input formulas into cells is by using the functions dialog box. Now you'll find this just to the left of the formula bar, and it's this little FX icon just here. When I hover over, it says insert function. Now, I know a lot of people who really love to use this, and in general, it's people who are reasonably new to formulas in Excel. Because what this allows you to do is basically type in a brief description of what you're trying to do, and then it's going to show you all of the formulas which match what you're trying to do. So if I was looking for a formula to add numbers, I might type in add numbers, click on go, and it's going to pull back all of the formulas that match. I can then look at the description underneath, which is going to tell me what that formula does. So I can go through all of these and I can say, here we go, adds all the numbers in a range of cells. That's exactly what I want to do. Let's click on OK. It opens up our function argument. So this is pretty much the same as when you're typing it directly into the cell. We just have our arguments listed in this nice little box as opposed to underneath where we're typing. So now I just need to define the numbers that I want to add up. So once again, we're going to select the cell range. I can then click on OK, and there I have my calculation. So a few different ways of doing some just there. Let's finish this off because this allows us to see a couple of other shortcuts. I'm going to add the totals for each month. So we're going to do sum again. I'm going to type it in this time, equals sum, open a bracket. I'm going to select the cell range that I want to sum, in this case, C3 to F3. Let's close our bracket. Now I'm going to copy this formula down. Now if I press the Enter key just here, my cursor moves to the cell below, which means if I now want to copy this formula down or do something else in the cell above, I then have to click back on the cell and then do what I want to do. A much better way of doing this is to press Control Enter at the end of your formula, and it's going to keep you in the same cell. So let's do that again. I'm going to say equals sum, open bracket. We're going to select the range that we want to add up, close our bracket. This time, Control Enter, and it leaves me in that same cell. I can then use my autofill handle to copy this formula down. And the autofill handle, you'll find that if you hover your mouse over the right hand corner, can you see in that cell there's a tiny little green square? And as I hover my mouse over, my cursor changes to a small black cross. That is your autofill handle. And what this will enable you to do is basically copy that formula and paste it into each cell. And you can do that simply by double clicking, and it's going to copy that formula down. Another way you could do this, if I control Z just to undo that, is I could just drag down. Let's control Z again. The third way I can copy something down is I can highlight all the cells I want to copy the formula to and press control D, and it's going to copy that sum formula down. OK, so quite a few different ways that you can use sum. We've got some keyboard shortcuts in there and some other tips and tricks. Hopefully, you've picked up something as we've gone through that. Let's move on now to talking about operators. Now, there is a lot more operators in Excel than what I have here. And operators are really those symbols that we have that perform our calculations. So I've just listed out the main four here, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Now, it's really important to be aware of what keys, what symbols you need to press in order to do things like a multiplication. So I've had some people who think that the X on their keyboard should be the multiplication sign. Remember, it's an asterisk if you want to multiply. It's a forward slash if you want to divide. OK, and then we just have a regular plus and a, a hyphen, I guess you could say, for subtraction. OK, make sure that you understand your operators so that you can use them efficiently. Now, let's do a little quick calculation down here, because this is going to lead me nicely into my next point, where we're going to start talking about mathematical rules. Again, this is going to be a bit like math class at high school, but it is really important going forward so you understand what's going on. What if I have something in a cell like 10 plus 6 divided by 2? What do you think the result of that calculation is going to be? 
Because it could be one of two things, depending on which way you decide to calculate this formula. Maybe I look at this formula and I think to myself, right, I'm going to do 10 plus 6 first, and then I'm going to divide by 2. So 10 plus 6 would be 16 divided by 2. I think the answer should be 8. Let's hit enter. Excel thinks the answer is 13. Now, why is that? Let's take a look. Well, it's doing it in a slightly different way. It's doing 6 divided by 2 first, which gives us 3, and then it's adding the 10. Now, why is it doing that? Well, it's doing that because of something called the bod mass rule, which leads me on to my next worksheet. Now, I've got this listed out twice because I know that when I was growing up in the UK, and I will say this was quite a long time ago, <laughs> so when I was at uh, junior school, we're talking 80s here, and this is what they taught us. They taught us bod mass. I know that in the US it is called something slightly different. The acronym is slightly different. I believe PID mass or, or PED mass or something like that. They're both the same rule. It's just how you phrase the different um, items. So, for example, in the UK, we say brackets, whereas in the US, they're more inclined to say parentheses. So these are both the same rule. And every Excel formula follows this rule. And this is what we call the order of calculations. So what we're saying here is that anything in a formula that's contained within brackets is going to be calculated first. It's then going to calculate any orders or indices, so things like square roots, if you have them in your formula. It will then do the division, multiplication, addition, and finally at the end, the subtraction is the last thing that it will do. So when we have something like 10 uh, plus 6 divided by 2, the reason why we get 13 is because if we look at the order, Excel is going to do the division before it does the addition. OK, so it's going to do 6 divided by 2 first and then the addition because it runs through this rule. So if I wanted to do 10 plus 6 first, what can I do? I can put, oops, I can put this part of the formula in brackets. OK, so it's going to do what's in brackets first, 10 plus 6, and then it's going to do the division. And that gives me my answer of 8. A really important rule to get your head around. This comes up again and again, particularly when you're looking at formulas and trying to work out what they're doing. Knowing the order that calculations are done in is going to be really helpful to you. OK, so don't forget that the bod mass or the PID mass, PED mass rule, however you want to determine it. So with all that in mind, let's move on now to taking a look at a few other formulas. Now, I mentioned at the beginning, there are formulas that I like to call the big Five. I've never heard anyone else refer to them as the big five, but I feel like these are the big five formulas. They're the ones that you tend to use first in Excel. They're the ones that you use fairly frequently, and they're also probably the easiest formulas to learn in Excel. Now, we've already seen one of them. One of them is called sum. And all of the others, if I click the auto sum button, you can see the others listed up here. We have average, count numbers, max, and min. So what do each of these formulas do? We know what sum does. It allows us to add up a range of cells. So you can see here in this table, again, we just have that same data. I have total average, min and max. So if I was doing the total, again, we're just using our sum formula. I can open the bracket, highlight my cells, close the bracket, hit enter. And then I can copy that down. I can select all the cells, control D to copy down. Boom, done. Very straightforward and simple. What about if I want to work out what the average is of these numbers? What are the average sales across all of these quarters? Well, this is where I can use the average function. And it works in pretty much the same way as the sum function. I can start to type in average. Notice I get IntelliSense underneath. If the function that I want is highlighted, which it is, I can just press the tab key to select it and save myself a couple of seconds. I then need to select my range. Again, we're just going to do the same range, close the bracket. I'm going to do control enter to stay in the same cell, and I can double click to copy that formula down. What does min do? Well, min allows us to find the minimum value in a range of cells. So maybe I want to find what the lowest value is so I can see uh, which quarter in January was the, the worst performing. OK, that is where we would use min. So again, I can just type it in min. 
open the bracket, select my range of cells, close the bracket, control, enter, and then I can double click to copy down. What does max do? It does the reverse of min. It gives us the maximum value in a range of cells. All very straightforward formulas, control, enter, and then I can double click to copy down. Good to know. And you can always combine these with other formulas. So once your knowledge starts to increase, you'll find that you're using these formulas, sum, average, min, and max with other formulas to perform more complex calculations. OK, now something I would advise you to do, because this is so useful. Notice if I highlight all of these cells in the Q1 column, cast your eyes down to my status bar. Can you see right at the bottom, I'm seeing information that shows me the average of that range of cells, the count, the numerical count, the minimum value, the maximum and the sum. Look at that. So if my boss comes to me and says to me, can you tell me uh, the total of all the sales in January? Instead of going in and having to do the sum calculation, I can simply highlight the cells and I can see the total in that status bar at the bottom. OK, super quick and super useful. Now, you need to turn something on in your status bar in order to be able to see these values. And I would recommend that you do do this. If you hover your mouse over your status bar right at the bottom and right click, it's these ones here that you want to make sure you turn on. Now, you don't necessarily have to have them all on. I do because I find them all useful, but at least make sure you've got maybe some or average, min and max turned on, something like that. Make sure that you have a tick next to them. You can see I can just toggle that off and on. And then you're going to see that information when you highlight a range of cells in that status bar. OK, super, super useful. So now we've seen some average, min and max. There is one more out of the big five that I haven't shown you yet, and that is count. Now, what does count do? Well, it will count the number of items in a range of cells. So here I have a very basic data set. I have some student names and I have their, their test scores, let's say. And I want to count how many students I have in this range of cells. So I can use the count formula. We're going to type in equals and I'm going to type in count. Open my bracket. Take a look at my arguments underneath. It's asking for the value. So what do I want to count? Well, I want to count the students. Now you might think to yourself, OK, I just need to highlight the student names. B4 to B20. Close the bracket and hit enter. It gives me a result of zero. Now, why does it give me zero? Why isn't it counting all of the student names? The formula is correct. Why isn't it counting anything? Well, this is a really important distinction between count and count A. Count will only count cells that contain numerical values. So because the cell range that I've selected contains text, it doesn't count them. OK, so if I wanted to use count just here, I would need to type in count and I would need to use the test scores instead because those are numerical values. And it's telling me I have 17 items in this list. If you want to count everything, so cells, it doesn't matter if they've got text or numbers in them or weird symbols. If you want to count everything, you would use count A, which stands for count all. OK, so now I can open my bracket. It, I can count the text cells, that's absolutely fine, and it should give me the same answer. Okay, that is an important distinction between count and count A. This one only counts numerical values, this one counts everything. Okay, make sure you have that straight. Now, a little bonus thing I'm going to throw in here is just very show, uh, quickly show you how you can start thinking about your formulas in a different way, and we're going to use count as our example. So it might be that you're looking at this little table and maybe you're only interested in seeing how many students scored above 80. OK, so in the test scores, how many students do we have that have excelled this year and have scored above 80? Well, this is where we can start to expand on our basic count formula. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use a different formula and it's called count open bracket. Count if allows us to specify, allows us to say count if 
the score is over a certain amount. And you can see we have two arguments underneath, range and then criteria. So sometimes when I'm looking at something like this, I kind of like to work backwards because I like to think to myself, what is my criteria here? Well, my criteria is that the test score has to be, let's say, equal to or greater than 80. So that is my criteria. Now, what am I testing this against? I'm testing it against, against the test scores. So this is going to be my range, C4 to C20, comma, moves me on to my next argument. So I'm saying to Excel, look at this range of data, C4 to C20, and tell me how many people have scored uh, greater than or equal to 80. So now I need to specify that as my criteria, and this needs to go in quote marks. So I want to specify if it is, and I can never get these symbols around the right way, greater than or equal, I think that's right, <laughs> to 80, oh, 80. It needs to go in brackets. Now that greater than sign and equals, those are also what we classify as operators. Okay, you may have come across these before. We have greater than, less than, equal to, between, things like that. Okay, so that is my criteria. I can close my bracket, hit enter, and it's telling me that seven students have scored 80 or above. Okay, so you can see how we're kind of expanding on our original formula here just a little bit. All right, hopefully that was reasonably straightforward. Let's move on to something that is fundamental to understanding Excel and being able to work in Excel. This is something you will come across all the time when you're working in spreadsheets. And if you don't really understand what's going on, it can be very, very confusing. And that is the difference between relative and absolute cell referencing. Now, there is another type of cell referencing that I didn't mention just there, and that is called mixed cell referencing. Now, I'm not going to talk about that too much in this particular lesson. We're going to focus on the, the main two that you'll come across, which is relative and absolute. Now, if you're not sure what these terms are, or you're not sure what they mean, let me show you some examples of both so you can understand. Let's first of all take a look at our data set. So what I have here in column A, I have a list of employee names. In column B, I have the department that they work in. In column C, I have the, the number of years that they've been working at this company. And in column D, I have their salary listed out in US dollars. I then have a bonus column, which is currently empty, and a new salary column, which is currently empty. And notice over here in cell J1, I have a bonus amount of 2%. So what I want to work out here is all of these employees are going to get a bonus of 2% of their salary. Lucky them. So I want to find out what that bonus is going to be. And then I want to work out what their new salary is. OK, so what are we going to do here? Well, I'm going to type in equals and I want to do a calculation. I want to work out what 2% of the salary is. And Excel, we do this by selecting the salary and we multiply it. So we've got our little asterisk operator in there by the bonus amount, the percentage bonus. So D2 multiplied by J1. Now, if I hit uh, enter just here, that's going to give me the correct answer. The bonus for this person is 697.56. So now I might think to myself, right, I'm just going to double click and copy this formula down and find the bonus for everybody. But take a look at what happens. I'm just going to copy it down so far because look, we have nothing in these cells. Why is that? Well, let's take a look at what's going on. I'm going to select one of these cells randomly down here. Now, if I double click in this cell, it's going to show me on the spreadsheet the cells that this formula refers to. So you can see here D10, that's the cell that's highlighted in blue. That's fine. That's exactly what I want it to be. But take a look at J9. That cell is blank. Now, why is it referencing J9? Well, if I escape out of here and we go back to our original cell, what Excel does is when you copy a formula down, Excel assumes that you want it to adjust all of the cell references and move them down by one. Now, I will say for most spreadsheets that you deal with, that works absolutely fine. And for this column, it's fine. So as we drag down, I want it to move down to the next salary. 
But when it comes to the bonus, I don't want it to move down. I want it to always reference cell J1. So this is what we call absolute referencing. The default is relative referencing, which is basically what you can see here. And that is Excel moving the cell references down by one every time you drag down a row. That's relative referencing and it's the default. But if we want to essentially lock or fix a reference, we need to use absolute referencing. So I'm going to delete out all of this and let's do it again. But this time we're going to use absolute referencing. So salary D2, this part was absolutely fine. So we can do multiplied by J1. Now, what do I need to do here to lock this cell so that it never moves? Well, I need to make it absolute. And we do that by pressing the F4 key on our keyboard. And what you'll notice in the formula is that it puts dollar signs in front of the row and the column. So essentially, it is locking the row and the column. Now, if you press F4 again, it cycles through four different types of referencing. So now we're looking at what we call mixed referencing. And as I said, I'm not going to go into this too much, but there will be occasions when you get towards the more intermediate level where you'll probably have to use mixed cell referencing. And in this case, we're locking the row, but we're not locking the column. If I press F4 again, this time we're locking the column, but not the row, F4 again, and it takes us back to relative referencing. But in this example, I want to lock both the column and the row, hit enter. And now this time, if I double click to copy down, you should find that that works. Let's double click on a cell. You can see it's referencing the correct one, D19, and it's also locked to J1. OK, this is something you'll come across all the time when you're putting formulas together. So important to understand when and where you need to lock your cells. Now that we have our bonus amounts, this is just a very straightforward, simple sum calculation to work out the new salary. I want to add the salary to the bonus. So we're just going to do sum, open bracket. I can select my numbers, close the bracket. I'm going to do control enter to stay in the cell and double click that autofill handle to copy it down. OK, now the beauty of this is because we are using a cell reference for our bonus amount, if you come back to this spreadsheet the year after, and maybe the manager's been very generous and said this year everyone's going to get a 3% bonus, all you have to do is come to this cell and change it to 3%. And all of your formulas are going to update. You don't have to go back into the formula and update it because you've used a cell reference. You only need to change it in one place. OK, this is all part of working efficiently in Excel. Absolute versus relative referencing really important concept. Let's jump across to our next example. Now, this is something I use all the time, and that is named ranges. I'm a, a massive fan of named ranges. If you ever watch any of my videos on YouTube or any of my webinars, you'll normally find named ranges are included somewhere. I love them. Named ranges, if you're not aware of what they are, they basically allow you to take a range of cells. So let's just say this range of cells just here, the customer range, and give them a name that makes sense. So I could call this range of cells customer, and then I can use that name in my formulas as opposed to using the cell references. Now, we're going to use a reasonably small data set here, but imagine if you had a data set that had 100,000 rows. Sometimes when you put in formulas together, if you want to select a range of cells and you've got 100,000 rows, that can be a bit of a pain. What you could do is name all of the, the cell ranges and then use those in your formulas instead. It does end up being a lot quicker and it also makes your spreadsheets a lot easier for people to read. If I send this to somebody else, it's easier for them to understand what the formula is doing if they can look at it and see that this refers to the customer range as opposed to just random cell references. So getting into this habit is really good. So let me show you how they work. Now, I have a very small table of data here, sales for the pencil factory. I have some order numbers. I have the customer, the quantity, the price per unit, and then the total sales. And I have some metrics that I want to extract over here. I want to find out the average quantity. I want to find out the number of orders. So I'm going to do a count here. I want to find the minimum sales, the maximum, and the total sales. So if we start with average quantity, I mean, I could go through and I could 
do this in exactly the way we've done it before. Type in average, I can select the quantity range, close the bracket, hit enter, and it's going to give me my answer. What I could do instead is I could name the range and use that in my formula. So let's do that for the second example. Now this one here, I want to find out the number of orders. So essentially I want it to count the number of orders. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to name the order range. Now I'm going to select the entire range and there are a couple of different ways that you can do this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to jump up to the formulas tab. In the defined names group, I'm going to say create from selection. And I'm going to tell Excel that I want to use the information in the top row, so in this case where it says order, as the name for this range. Let's click on OK. Now, if you've named a range, if you want to find where that is, you can see this little box to the side, to the left hand side of the formula bar. As I hover over, it says name box. If I click the drop down, it's going to show me any named ranges that I have in my workbook. And currently you can see the only one I have is order. Now if I click on it, it's going to jump me back to that highlighted range. So named ranges can also be quite good for navigation. They allow you to navigate between your workbooks by selecting the range to jump straight to it. So now that I have this name, I can use it in my calculation. So I'm going to type in equals count, open bracket. What do I want to count? I want to count the number of orders. Now, instead of selecting the cell range, I'm going to start to type in the name of the range. Notice Excel's IntelliSense underneath is picking up my uh, range name at the bottom, order. I can use my arrow keys to go down, tab to select it. Close the bracket, hit enter, and I get my result. So anybody looking at this formula, if we take a look up in the formula bar, you can see that straight away I can see, right, they're doing a count. Oh, it's the order column that they're counting. OK, otherwise I just have cell references in here and it just takes a little bit longer to work out, particularly if your spreadsheet is very large and full of data. How can we do this uh, in another way? Well, we can set up named ranges for the rest of these as well. So currently I only have order set up, but I want a named range for customer, for quantity, for price and for total. Now I can set these up as named ranges all in one go by highlighting the whole lot, going back to create from selection and saying that I want to use the name in the top row. So customer, quantity, etc. Click on OK. Now, if I click in the name box, you can see I have all of those named ranges just there. So if I select quantity, it's going to jump to that quantity range. So now I can use any of these in my calculations. So for this next one, I want to work out the minimum sales. So the minimum uh, sales total. So I'm going to use min, open bracket. Again, I can start to type in the name of the range. And as I type it in, you can see IntelliSense has picked it up. I can press the tab key, close my bracket, hit enter, and I get my results. Now, what if you cannot remember what you've called your named range? Because this might be a spreadsheet that you haven't looked at for six months or for a year. Maybe I'm not going to know that I've named ranges customer and quantity and total. So I don't know how to search for them. Well, let's take a look. We're going to work out the max this time. What I can do is I can press the F3 key. And it's going to pull up all of the named ranges that I have in my workbook. I can then go through and I can then see them all and I can select the one that I want to use. So for this one, we're doing the maximum sales. So I want to select total, click on OK, close the bracket, hit enter. OK, so very, very straightforward. The last one here is just going to be a, a sum calculation. So I can type in equals sum, open bracket. Again, I'm going to press the F3 key and we're going to sum the, let's sum the totals, close bracket, hit enter, and there we go. So that is how you can use named ranges in your formulas as well. OK, get into the habit. It's really useful. Now, let's move on a bit. We've taken a look at sort of some of the more basic formulas. We've seen some keyboard shortcuts, ways that we can use these functions in different ways. Let's move on now to combining functions together. So this is where we take um, more than one function and shove them together in one formula. 
Now, for this example, I'm going to be using some text functions. And again, these are text functions that everybody should know. Now, you can see here I have a table. I have some salespeople listed in the first column. And then I have their Q1 to Q4 sales results. And then if they've got a bonus or not on the end. Now, the thing that I want to focus on in this particular part of the session is column B. So where we have these salespeople listed out, you can see that the way these are typed out is not very consistent. So I have some that are in uppercase. I have uh, a couple that are in lowercase. And I also have some weird spacing going on. So some weird spaces at the beginning of these names. I could have some weird spaces at the end, which I can't actually see. So what we want to do here is we want to tidy up this data to make it consistent. Why is that important? Well, you'll find out when you want to start doing analysis on this data. Because what you'll find is that if you don't clean up and tidy your data prior to creating things like maybe a table or a pivot table or a chart, you'll find that your results start to become inaccurate. So you always want to make sure that you start off with a clean and consistent data set before you go on to analyze it any further. And this kind of situation here, whilst it is quite a contrived example, it's just something that I've created, this isn't unusual, particularly if you uh, import spreadsheets from other systems. So maybe if you use a system like Salesforce or some kind of third party system, and maybe every week you get a file download, sometimes that file, when you open it up in Excel, can come across and it's all a bit crazy and all over the place. And you have to harness techniques in Excel to be able to clean up that data and make it look presentable. Now, one of the ways that we can do that is that we can use text functions. And I'm just going to show you how to combine three of them together to make this column look a lot better than it currently does. Now, when I'm doing things like this, if I'm cleaning a particular column, I always like to have what I call a helper column. And that is just a blank column that I've added in the middle there, which is going to allow me to uh, create some formulas, which is going to tidy up the text in these cells. Now, the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you three uh, functions that are really simple to use, and they just change the case of the text that you select. So I'm going to type in equals. Now, if I want to change the case to lowercase, I can just type in lower, open bracket. We have one argument. We need to tell Excel what text we want to change. I want to change the text in cell B4, close the bracket, hit enter. It's going to change everything to lower case. Notice it hasn't done anything about this weird spacing. It just deals with the case. I'm going to control Z out of there. Let's double click. If I want to change everything to uppercase, I could use upper in there instead. OK, what we want to use is something called proper case, which is basically going to capitalize the first letter of every word. And I can copy that down. OK, so three formulas there to change the case, upper, lower and proper. Now it's changed the case. As I said, it hasn't really done anything about these extraneous spaces that we have in some of these cells. So I want to remove all of this weird spacing. Now, there is another formula that we have in Excel that will do that, and that is the trim formula. So instead of inserting another helper column and running trim on this data set, I can combine it with this proper formula and do both at the same time. So let's go up to the formula bar and we're going to combine trim and proper together. So I'm going to type in trim at the beginning there. I need to open a bracket. You can see trim. The first argument is text. Well, the text that we want to trim is basically going to be generated by this proper formula just here. So all I need to do is click at the end and I need to add another bracket. Now, why do I do that? In Excel, you always have to close off as many brackets or parentheses as you've opened. So because I've opened two brackets, I need to make sure I have two brackets closed off at the end. Hit enter. And then I'm going to double click to copy that formula down. Notice what has happened. Not only is it changing it to proper case, it's also trimming out those extraneous spaces. So I've managed to combine two formulas there. 
Now I could go a stage further and add in another formula into here. So another formula that's kind of similar is the clean formula. And what clean does is it removes non-printing characters from your cells. Now, I don't actually have any non-printing characters currently in this worksheet, but it works basically the same as the trim function. So if I wanted to use it, I could just go up to my formula in the formula bar. I can add clean at the start there, open a bracket, the only argument is text. Well, the text is going to be generated by the trim and proper commands. So I just need to go to the end and add another closing bracket because now I have three opening. I need to have three closing. Close the bracket, copy it down. And if I had any non-printing characters, it would remove them from the cells. So the point of this exercise is really to show you how you can start to combine functions together to make a really powerful formula. In the space of one formula, we've cleaned non-printing characters, we've removed extraneous spaces, and we've changed the case. Now, one other thing that I want to point out here before we leave this little section is you might think, OK, now I have my clean column. I can just go in and delete this column just here. You can't, you're going to get reference errors. Now, why do you get reference errors? Well, the formulas in this column refer to column B4. So they refer to this column. So if we delete the column, that is why we're gonna get an error. So the thing I always do here is once I have my clean data, I then select it all, control C to copy. And then I go to the home tab. I click the lower half of the paste button and I do a paste values straight over the top. Because what that does is it basically throws away all of the underlying formulas. So now if I click on these cells, if you take a look in the formula bar, it's just showing me the text. It doesn't show me those formulas because it's basically removed them and just left the text. So now I can pretty much remove this column, delete it, and everything's going to stay fine. I'm just going to re-add that title back in. OK, combining formulas and then using paste special, something I use all the time. Let me just do a quick time check. OK, so I've got quite a lot left to cover. I'm going to carry on going for about 10 more minutes. And then if we get to just after seven, I will um, I will stop talking. and We'll have to save the rest for another day. I always run out of time. Let's try and blast through some of these. So I just want to show you a few more text functions. Some other functions that you really will find useful are these text functions just here, len, left, right, and mid. And these are used for extracting parts of a text string. So for example, I've got here in cell A4, this might be something like a part number. So ABC-123-GHY. And I can use these functions to extract parts of this part number and also find the length of the entire text string. So the len function, if we type in equals len, open bracket, very simple function. We just need to provide the text, which is in A4. It's going to tell us how many characters we have in this text string length. If I use left, open the bracket, I have two arguments. Now, what left will do is it will allow you to extract a certain number of characters that you specify from the left. So the first argument here is text. My text is located in cell A4, comma. How many characters from the left do I want to extract? Well, I want to extract the first part before the hyphen. So I want to extract the first three characters. Close my bracket, hit enter, and it gives me ABC. I'm sure you can tell what's coming here. Right will do the same thing, but it's going to extract from the right this time. So if I want to extract the last three characters, I can do exactly the same. Close the bracket and it's going to give me G-H-Y. Mid is very slightly different. This will allow you to extract characters from the middle of a text string. So we're going to type in equals mid, open the bracket. We have another argument in here. So the first thing we want is the text, which is A4. We need to provide the start number. So if I want to extract one, two, three, I need to provide the starting character. So how many across are we? So one, two, three, four. The part I want to extract starts on the fifth character. And then I want to extract the next three characters. Close the bracket, hit enter, and it gives me one, two, three. Very straightforward formulas that you can combine with others to produce a really complex result. 
Now, these, in their simplest form, rely on there being a certain kind of uh, standard amongst the text that you're trying to extract. So if I had a big long list of part numbers, which all had this layout, sort of three, 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 then I could definitely use these formulas, copy them down, and we would be sweet. But we don't live in a perfect world. What if I want to do something a little bit more complex? So for example, underneath here, I have email addresses, and I want to extract the first name. So Deb, Adam, Julie, Claire. But each of these is a different length. So if I was to use equals left and say I want to extract from this cell, and for this first one, I want to extract Deb, so that's the first three characters. Let's close the bracket here, enter. It's fine for that one, but if I copy it down, it's going to extract the first three characters each time. So that's not going to work for the rest of them. So what can we do here when we have inconsistent uh, lengths of characters that we want to extract? Well, this is where we get a little bit more complex. And if this blows your mind a little bit at this stage, don't worry. It's useful to have in the back of your mind. What we want to do here is we need to take a look at what we want to extract and find something that's common between all of these. So I can see that we have an at symbol in every single one of these email addresses. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell Excel, find the at symbol and then extract everything before the at symbol. And that should give me what I'm looking for. So for this, we're going to use the find function, open bracket. Our first argument, what are we looking for? What are we trying to find in this string? Well, I want to find the at sign. That needs to go in quote marks. That's what I'm looking for, comma. Within text is the next argument. Where am I looking for the at symbol? Well, I'm looking for it in cell A9. That is all I need. I don't need a start number. And another thing to note here with these arguments is that if you see an argument that has square brackets around it, it means that it's an optional argument. You don't have to add it for the formula to work. In this case, we don't need it. I just want to extract the number of characters. So this is telling me, if I copy this down, the position of that at symbol in each of these strings. So in the first one, it's in position four, position five, position six, and position seven. Now I'm gonna use this information to kind of get what I want. So the next thing I want to do here in just a, a blank cell is I'm gonna type in equals left and open bracket. Now the first argument here is text. So we're gonna select text, comma, number of characters. Well, for this, I want to say B9, now, if I just leave it at that and close the bracket, it's going to give me that. It's going to give me the at symbol as well. OK, so what we need to do is say B9 and we just want it to go back one. So minus one. And it's going to extract exactly what we're looking for, like so. OK, so what we can do then is we can then do our little copy and paste trick over the top and we have exactly what we're looking for. All right, so a little bit more complex, but it just shows you how you can think outside the box a little bit to get the result that you want. And this is the way that you need to start thinking in Excel. Let's go through a couple more. Now, this one I'll do because this is a, a very new function in Excel, but so useful. I'm so glad they brought this in. Now, you'll have this function if you have the latest version of Excel. So if you have a Microsoft 365 subscription, you should have the unique function. A way of checking is just to start typing in unique. And if you can see it come up underneath, then you have access to this function. Now, what this will do is it will extract a unique list from a range of cells that you specify. So you can see here, I have a list of different cities, but they do repeat. So I have London repeated a few times, Paris, Oslo, so on and so forth. And I just really want to extract a unique list of values. Very straightforward with unique. It used to be very difficult before this function. Open bracket, we simply need to select the cell range, close the bracket, hit enter, boom, there we go. A unique list of values. So straightforward, no more messing around with count and things like that, which we used to have to do before. Let's take a look at um, the concat function. Again, this is something else that you'll probably come across quite a lot. And what concat does, and I will say it, it is called concatenate in slightly older versions of Excel. If you have a newer version, concat. 
What this does, it allows us to join two text strings together. So if I show you a very basic example, if I had, let's say if I had my name, in two separate cells. And this is a fairly common example. You might have a list of people's first names and their last names, and maybe you want to combine them together, first name and last name, in one cell. You could use concat to do that. So I could say equals concat, open bracket. And all we need to do is say text one, comma, text two. Now take a look at what result this produces. It gives me what I want, but it's not got a space in between there. So you must tell Excel that you want to have a space between these two words. So if I double click and go back to my formula, I want D18, which is my first name, but then I want to have a space and that needs to go in quote marks. So I want to have quote mark, space, quote mark, and then we want our second piece of text. Enter and we get exactly what we want. OK, so that is kind of the principle. So how would this work on a more practical example? Well, maybe I have something like this. Sales figures listed in one cell. And then I've got a little drop down just here, which the users can select different years from this drop down list. And this might be uh, related to some kind of chart or figures. And when, we, when they change the drop down, it changes the figures. And maybe we want to have a title that also dynamically updates. So if they select 2018, we want the title to say sales figures space hyphen space 2018, or if they've select 2019, we want it to say that. So again, we can use concat. So we're going to say concat open bracket. What is our first piece of text? Our first piece of text is sales figures. Now I want it to say basically uh, space hyphen space. So quote marks space hyphen space quote marks, comma, and then I want it to concatenate it with whatever is in cell B17. And that could be any one of three different years. Close the bracket, hit enter, and that is the title that we get. So when they change this here, you'll notice that that title is also going to update. Concat, really useful, one of those functions you can use in lots of different situations. Right, um, very quickly, I'll just show you these ones at the bottom, date and time. So again, super useful, particularly if you work in things like finance. If you want to just have today's date on your worksheet, we have a function called today. It has no arguments, so you just need to do an open and a closing bracket, hit enter. And this date will dynamically update. So this will change when the day changes. So it means that it's always going to be up to date in your spreadsheet. We have another function that's similar to that called now, open and close. And that's going to give you the date and the time. And again, these are going to dynamically update. Now, sometimes that's fine, but sometimes you'll want to hard code today's date into a spreadsheet. I know in accounting, a lot of the time they like to have a hard coded date that never changes for historical purposes. So if you do want to hard code today's date in, you can do control semicolon, and that's going to give you today's date. If you wanted to do the time, control shift semicolon, and that will hard code in the time as well. OK, so a few little tips and tricks just there. Now I can see it is uh, five past seven. I do have ifs and VLOOKUPs to show you. Um, I don't know if people want to carry on or uh, if we should maybe just save that for another session. Yeah, I think maybe we'll try and run another session this year, Debs, and maybe yep. we'll uh, we'll do a follow-on and we'll do ifs and uh, and the luck up there. Let's just get into the good can. stuff as well. It's never long enough now, you see. Never long enough, is it? I know, I know. Great, great work though. Um, so um, yeah, I know we are getting a few people that want to carry on. So maybe let's just cover. Maybe let's just cover the lookup. I think that's probably the big one. And then I tell you what, we'll try before Christmas to do if a session of yeah look on logical functions generally. Okay, all reckon? right. Because, then we, because if is a bit complicated to get into in five minutes, V lookup I think we can cover. So, exactly. Uh, all, right, all right. Let's let's, let's quickly let's, do V lookup. Why let's not? Do it. Let's do V lookup. Cool. I love a, I love a bit of V lookup. I'm I'm very impressed that you're all so enthusiastic. Yeah, I, I, love I, it. I am as well. <laughs> I thought people would be uh, having enough of Excel by now, but apparently not. So let's let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do V lookup. I'm just conscious of people who have to eat lunch and things like that. I don't I want to, we, I don't want to keep had, you here we've forever. We've had a few people <laughs> drop off already and say bye, but um, they'll, they'll catch it on the recording. 
No worries. Okay, right. VLOOKUP, probably the most popular formula in Excel. And there is good reason for that. It is super useful. And if you're learning, just starting to learn formulas, I mean, again, this might be a little bit much at this stage. But if you are coping OK with everything I've shown you so far, this is going to be a breeze. People tend to think VLOOKUP is a lot more difficult than it actually is. So what do we use VLOOKUP for? Well, we can use it to look up information. So the example that I'm using here, I have a small table that contains some part numbers. And currently, they have no description and no unit price. Now, on this other spreadsheet just here called Catalog, I have a table that contains part numbers, the description, and the unit price. So basically, what I want to do here is I want to say to Excel, look up the part number in this catalog and then return to me the description and the price that corresponds to that part number. This is where we would use VLOOKUP. Now, there's lots of different functions that can do something similar. And I will say that when you start to get into your lookup formulas, you'll probably start to find that VLOOKUP does have certain limitations, which it does. And then you'll want to start to move on to something like index and match to do your lookups. Now, I'm not going to go off down that tangent just yet because VLOOKUP is still very useful. But it works on a very basic principle, and that is VLOOKUP when you're using it, it basically can only look through your data in one direction. So it can look from left to right. Now, what that means for you when you're putting together your formulas is that the piece of information that you're going to use to look up. So for us, we're going to use the part number as our reference. We want to look that up in the catalog and then we want to return the description of the unit price. The lookup value, the part number, must be to the left of the information that you want to look up. Now, in this example, it is. Our lookup value is in column A. The things that we want to return are, um, not to the left, sorry, are to the right of the part number. And this is when we can use VLOOKUP. If I was using the price as the lookup value and I wanted to return the description or the part number, VLOOKUP won't work. It cannot look backwards, essentially, through its data. That is where you would use index and match. But let's not go too far off down that tangent. Now, the first thing I'm going to do here is, and I would recommend you do this, if you're going to do a lookup, always put your data either in a table or name the range. It's going to make it so much easier, particularly if you have your, your catalog or what you're looking up the information in on a different worksheet to where you want your inputs. So what I'm going to do here very quickly is I'm going to name this range of data. I'm going to click in the middle, Control A to select my data. And I'm going to give it a name, I'm essentially going to make it a named range. Now, another way that we can create a named range is simply by clicking in this name box just here and typing in a name. So I'm going to call this catalog. I'm going to hit enter and I have myself a named range. Now, in this example, the part number is essentially column one, the description, column two, the price, column three. This is important information for when you're constructing your VLOOKUP. So let's go back. We're going to type in equals VLOOKUP open bracket. We have four different arguments. The first one is lookup value. So this is what are we using as our key? What is our lookup value? Well, our lookup value is the part number B6, comma. Table array, where are we looking up the part number? I could click across to the other worksheet and select the cell range. But as I said, if you've named the range, it means you don't have to move off of this worksheet. You can press the F3 key. Remember, that's going to pull up all your named ranges. I can select catalog. That is where we're looking up the part number. It says, OK, once I've found the part number in that range, what column of information do you want me to return? Remember, they're numbered from left to right. One, two, three. And I want to pull back the description for this part number. So the column is two. Final argument. Do I want to do an approximate match or an exact match? Oh, what I want to do here is I want it to exactly match the part number. It has to exactly exist in that format in the table. So I want to type false on the end just here and close the bracket. That is it. That is all there is to VLOOKUP. And I can copy that down.
Okay, now notice here that we have an NA, so I'm going to assume that this part number doesn't exist in this table. Now, I can do a quick check if I go back to the catalogue, control F to find, I can search for the number 1234, find next. It doesn't look to me like that number exists in the catalogue. So what I could do here is to make this a little bit more explanatory and instead of having just like NA errors all over my spreadsheet, I could add in an error checking formula, which is going to allow me to make this a little bit more meaningful. So instead of NA, I might want it to say part not found so that anybody who's looking at this spreadsheet knows exactly why it hasn't pulled back the description. Now in Excel, there are a couple of different ways that you can type, um, a couple of different formulas, I should say, that you can use to handle errors in cells. You have if error, which is, oops, help if I type that right, if error, which is kind of a catch all. You can use this to handle any errors in your spreadsheet. But there is also an if NA, which is specifically for NA errors in a spreadsheet. So this is the one I'm going to use. I can go up to the formula bar. And all I'm going to do is add if NA on the front there, open a bracket. Again, we're combining multiple formulas here. The first argument value, well, the value is going to be generated by the VLOOKUP. So let's click on the end. Value if NA. So what do we want it to say if it finds NA in a cell? I want it to say not found. This bracket, hit enter, and then I can copy that down. And you can see now it's a lot easier to understand. Let's finish off very quickly by doing the unit price. Let's do our VLOOKUP again. Open the bracket. Our lookup value is the cell reference B6. We're looking it up in our table. I'm going to press F3 and select the catalog. Click on OK. Column index number. This time I want the unit price. So I want to pull back column number three. And I want to do an exact match of the part number. So we want a false on the end just there. Hit enter. And there we go, double click to copy down. Of course, I could go back in here and add in my error checking. I won't just to save a little bit of time, but you could add if NA to the front of this as well. And that is how a basic V lookup works. Not as scary as people make out. And of course, there are lots of different ways that you can use V lookup as well. We've just barely scratched the surface, but hopefully that's a good introduction. If you're not a subscriber, Click down below to subscribe so you get notified about similar videos we upload. To get the files the instructor used in this tutorial and follow along, click over there. And click over there to watch more videos on YouTube from Simon Says It.